you can't love yourself, how the hell are you going to love anyone else? Can I get an amen? <laughs> so goes the wisdom of RuPaul, and it's something that I want to use to explain one of the most fascinating and influential parts of modern European philosophy. That is, Hegel's dialectic of self-consciousness, lordship, and servitude in the phenomenology of spirits. So what I love about the RuPaul quote here is that we can use it to reconcile two of the main ways in which people read Hegel when talking about this idea of lordship and bondage, you know, both the epistemological ways and the social ways. And that quote actually allows us to relate each to the other dialectically. But before we get into the weeds of how we're going to do that, I'm just going to summarize Hegel's point for you through a transformation of the RuPaul itself, so you know what to expect as we go through it. Hegel's point will be that if you cannot recognize that your empirical sense of yourself is just as important to your knowledge and experience of the world as your transcendental self, then how could you ever recognize anyone else as a person, given that you only experience their selfhood empirically, that is, in experience? Now let's just unpack those two main terms first. The empirical self and the transcendental self. The empirical self is the self which lives, experiences things through the medium of its life, and in living through those experiences. It is the self in experience, and therefore in Hegel's term, it is the self for itself. It is that which feels hunger, passion, warmth, and love. It is determined by life, and it determines itself through the way in which it lives. The transcendental self, however, is not immediately given in experience. It is rather a condition or principle of experience, and indeed of the experience of self-consciousness itself. The transcendental self is that principle which states that every object of experience, insofar as it is an object, is as such because it is an object for a subject which experiences it. It is the sight of experience which makes it possible which makes any such experience my experience. No matter what experience I have, it's only an experience for me if it can be accompanied by an I think which may accompany it. The whole first sections of Hegel's dialectic of self-consciousness, including that of lordship and bondage, constitute self-consciousness' own attempt to work this principle out and the relationship between the transcendental and the empirical self. That is, where in Hegel's phenomenology, his argumentation is structured more like a tragic play or morality tale about consciousness' attempt to know the world, where we, the reader, watch the subject of knowledge, called consciousness, try again and again to know things, and with each failure to know, learning a lot more about itself, its object, and the relations between the two, which compose its knowledge and the experience of each. The self-consciousness chapter begins when the main character of the book, consciousness, adopts this principle of transcendental subjectivity, becoming self-consciousness. And with this, it gets pretty boastful of itself. It starts knowing that actually, every object isn't only an object because it's an object for me, the subject. So really, these things are all dependent on my knowing them, on my transcendental subjectivity that makes them an object for a subject. And that subject is me, which stands above them all. However, this is a dialectic of the pursuit of knowledge. Self-consciousness only knows transcendental subjectivity to be the truth of this object in principle, but is nonetheless impelled to realize what it is in itself explicitly, that is, for itself. In lacking something of itself in knowledge, to which it is impelled to seek out and to destroy any separation between itself and the object it wants to know, self-consciousness is therefore trapped in its desire to know itself for what it is it thinks in itself must become for itself. So to go around proving its self-consciousness to itself, to to experience self-consciousness, it goes around destroying the objects that it experiences in its life. It shows that their continued existence, indeed their independent life from the transcendental subject, from self-consciousness, is nothing to it, and that it stands above them. Imagine someone going around just eating everything to prove that the continued existence of food is dependent on them not eating it, and therefore in eating it they destroy the distance between themselves and the food. The problem is this just makes self-consciousness dependent on those objects, because without them it couldn't prove its independence from them by eating or destroying them. So, guess what? Self-consciousness has made itself dependent instead, the complete opposite of what it wanted. So our friend here has to change tactics. 
they need to find something which they can destroy the independence of without it being totally gone. Because then you just need to go find another thing to destroy. Well, self-consciousness has just made itself dependent on something else, and it's still around. It just makes itself dependent without being destroyed. And so it thinks, well, I need another thing like me. Something where you can make it dependent on something else, and actually you don't destroy it. You can have your cake and eat it. That's what self-conscious is thinking here. Have your cake and then eat it. Because the cakes can go away when you eat it. <laughs> Eventually, according to Hegel, self-consciousness does find another self-consciousness. It thinks. You see, you cannot actually see the transcendental self. It's a condition of experience. It's not in experience. It isn't something empirical. We're not going to see the I equals I, or you know, the I think floating about there, like Descartes, you know, thinking thing. Even he couldn't experience it. He simply had to deduce it. All self-consciousness will be seeing in this other self-consciousness is an empirical self. That's an object with its own living experience that is also alive, but it's not quite transcendental subjectivity. So in a way, self-consciousness needs to go and test its theory that there is another self-consciousness out there. In order to test whether this other life is really what will do the job, self-consciousness initiates a fight to the death with the other one. Because if each one can risk their objective life on this earth, then they clearly hold the same principle that their transcendental subjectivity is what really counts, and therefore it is a, the other self-conscious really is a self-consciousness. So they fight. One of them, having been brought to the brink of death, surrenders. Because in coming so close to losing their life, in that fear, they have realized actually their life and empirical self is actually worth holding on to. And so one becomes the master, or heir, and the other the bondsman, or knecht, from where in English we get the word knight. It's a very feudal order, this. The master has proven their independence from the world in risking their life, and the bondsman recognizes this and affirms it by becoming dependent on the master, by service to the master. The bondsman depends on them, because if they don't work, well, the master has already shown their willingness to kill them, and this bondsman really wants to stay alive, so as Hegel famously notes, this relationship still doesn't work. He may have placed the... Uh, you may have placed a, the servant in between you and the objects you want to do, negate the independence of. You know, you, you place a servant in between the animal and you, when you eat it, you know, cooked up as a steak or something. But the master is still dependent on the bondsman for their food. The master doesn't know how to cook, doesn't know how to do anything. It knows how to kill, but can't really do anything else. It kind of sits there just eating everything, you know, the quintessential feudal king or feudal lord just constantly sitting around drinking wine and munching on a huge like, turkey leg, you know. And it's, it just doesn't work. It just creates more and more dependency. The master is still dependent on the bondsman, and the bondsman, however, having been so terrified for their life that they have given it over to the master, actually ends up, in Hegel's terms, a little bit closer to what self-consciousness was trying to get at, because in giving their life over to the master, they have brought their transcendental and empirical self into a kind of defective unity, because their life is dependent on the master's sense of self, which is dominated by the transcendental self. It sees itself to be above life. And said transcendental self is dependent on the servant. The master is dependent on the servant's life. The servant's life is dependent on the master's transcendental self-consciousness. There's a cycle of mutual dependence there, even though it is still one-sided, because only one person is recognizing the other as independent, even though practically this works itself out differently. Hegel knows the solutions to this whole messy affair, and really this isn't for self-consciousness to know at this point in the phenomenology of spirit. Self-consciousness isn't going to find this out till way later down the line. But luckily, Hegel does turn to the audience, to the reader, to us, and gives us the answer to this whole problematic of working out dependence versus interdependence, and that is the idea of mutual recognition. Both recognize the other as independent, both in a way serve the other by recognizing the other, and therefore the, in the independence of each becomes mutually interdependent across them. It's a social relationship or a doubled relationship. We could actually take this idea of mutual recognition in both senses of way to read this, both social and epistemological concerning knowledge. Now this is because here we go back to RuPaul. If you can't recognize that your empirical self, your living experience, and indeed your individual life is just as necessary for your experience of the world as your transcendental self, i.e. the principle that a formal subjectivity conditions all of your experience, making it possible as my experience, then any attempt to elevate the transcendental over the empirical will fail. 
because like the master, it always ends up as something dependent on living experience to know itself, and indeed requires you to be alive in order to experience anything at all. If you're just dead, the transcendental eye can't really experience anything. It can't be a sight for experience if there's no experience happening. That requires life. As a consequence, the transcendental self in experience implies the necessity of the empirical self and vice versa. You need life for experience, you need the conditions of experience to have living experience. Now, the mutual recognition of the essentiality and interdependence of the two kinds of selfhood, transcendental and empirical, it works yeah. on the individual level particularly, but nonetheless it can also translate into the social reading of this dialectic. This is because we only experience each other's selfhood in experience itself. We cannot see their transcendental condition of apperception floating around out there. But if we encounter an empirical subjectivity, if it speaks, hungers, it acts epically and so on, we can then, by implication, from ourselves, recognize that there is a transcendental selfhood there and that the other being is a self-consciousness. Ah, well, how do we determine what empirically is a self-consciousness versus something that just acts like a self? There's the point of contention, and this is where Hegel brings forth histories of mutual interdependence which constitute objective mind, or objective geist, spirit. To do this, he develops on spheres of historical custom, culture, and anthropology to determine empirical stages of developed or manifest geist. The ways in which the transcendental manifests itself and actualizes itself in individual life. It is these points of demarcation between developed and undeveloped selfhood, what acts like a self, what is a self, that provide the most problematic imperialist and Eurocentric aspects of Hegelian thought. It is the very violence of recognition which captures the other in the self-consciousness of mastery and domination. And yet, it is only through such encounters as these where we can unpack these monoliths of Hegelian density that we can tackle and trace these problematics to the very heart of modern history. My hope is that through grasping these moments of Hegel, we can find their limits and turn the eye of the philosopher back upon himself, revealing the falsity of that which empires and idealists once claimed to be true. Can I get an amen?